Pour sauver les principaux monuments de Libye, que les eaux du Nil allaient alors inexorablement recouvrir, il fallait que fût mobilisée dans le monde entier une somme de talent, d'énergie, d'expérience et de capitaux que seul un prodige pouvait réunir. Ce prodige a eu lieu. C'est celui de la solidarité internationale. The first, Aswan Dam, and its resulting lake, had reduced Nubia to a few plantations of palm trees and seasonal crops, and numerous villages which had had, had to be rebuilt. These, however, were all doomed. Economic needs led to the building of a new dam, which created a huge lake, 500 kilometers in length, and which served as an energy source for the neighboring electric power station and helped to increase the land suitable for cultivation. South of the dam, however, all the ancient monuments lying on both sides of the lake were destined to disappear if no international response was made to the appeal of the Egyptian and Sudanese governments. In March 1960, during an official celebration held by UNESCO, an appeal was made for international solidarity. Une protection universelle est due aux monuments de valeur universelle. Votre appel n'appartient pas à l'histoire de l'esprit parce qu'il veut sauver les temples de Nubie, mais parce qu'avec lui, la première civilisation mondiale revendique publiquement l'art mondial comme son indivisible héritage. The temples of Abu Simbel, built in rock, stand tall and majestic on the outskirts of the Nubian desert. The great temple, buried under the sand, was only discovered in 1813 by Ludwig Burkhard, the Swiss Orientalist. Of these temples, situated along the Nile, south of Aswan, the smallest is dedicated to the goddess Hathor, its facades are decorated with colossal statues of more than 10 meters in height, representing Ramses II and his wife Nefertari. The illustrious monarch of the 19th dynasty, Ramses, had these temples built in 1260 BC at the end of the Golden Age in Egypt. Four colossal statues of more than 20 meters in height, representing the pharaoh, stand in front of the great temple. Beside these giants, the members of the royal family look like dwarfs. On the outer walls, bas-reliefs portray the life of the people 3,000 years ago. Two divinities link the lotus and papyrus, symbolizing the unity of the kingdoms of Lower and Upper Egypt. Besides the statues of the queen and her favorite children, the facade of the temple is decorated with effigies, symbolizing the greatness of the sovereign and the respect he inspired in his enemies. The inscriptions narrate feats accomplished under his rule. Long lines of captives are witness to his military prowess.
impressive sight is that of the sunset seen through the temple, an effect created by the particular position of the temple. It's evidence of the skill of the architects of that period and their knowledge of astronomy. Twice a year, in February and in October, the rays of the sun miraculously penetrate into the narrow gallery between the huge pillars and reach far into the inner sanctuary, usually bathed in darkness. These rays illuminate the statues of the three gods, Amun, Ra Horakti, and the Pharaoh himself, leaving the statue of Ptah, the god of the underworld, in darkness. In the great hall of columns, the colossi measure more than eight meters in height and lend the pharaoh the attributes of the god Osiris. The bas-reliefs tell of the glory of the monarch. In 1285 BC, in a grand military battle in Syria, Ramses defeated the Hittites, who had dared invade his kingdom. One cannot but admire the superb talent of the artists of that period. thousand years later, the descendants of the pharaoh are faced with problems that would have bewildered their ancestor. The area where this rapidly growing population lives and works is limited to the narrow strips of fertile land along the banks of the Nile. The famous wheat gallery is now too small. The construction of the high dam has to meet the needs of the whole of the United Arab Republic. A large lake extends deep into the Sudan, making it possible to irrigate vast areas and to increase cultivation, while the electric energy produced allows new industries to emerge. But the construction of the dam has many drawbacks. Hundreds of thousands of people have to be moved, and many unique Nubian monuments would have disappeared if no action had been taken in time. The whole world is moved by the dangers that threaten the Nubian monuments. The United Arab Republic appeals to UNESCO, which launches an international campaign to save Egypt's heritage. More than 50 countries agree to participate in financing the project, and then starts the race against time and the rising of the water level. Several plans are proposed, and finally the following one is adopted. A barrier of wooden planks will be erected to protect the temples during the work operations. A thick layer of sand will cover the statues of Ramses. A system of girders will be constructed to support the inside of the temples. Finally, all the rocks surrounding the temples will be cleared away, leaving a protective armour of 80 centimetres.
temples themselves will be cut into blocks of 20 to 30 tons and stored safely away. Then the temples will be reassembled on a new site 60 meters higher and their natural surroundings recreated. In November 1963, the consortium of Abu Simbel, grouping the enterprises of five countries, receives a contract for the work to begin. It is a delicate operation, made even more difficult by the climate and the isolation of the sites. The nearest town, Aswan, is 300 kilometers to the north on the Nile. There are no routes to transport the equipment, machines, workers or food. Any equipment coming from Europe takes five months to arrive to its destination. And yet, there is no time to lose. Even before building lodgings for the workers, the work of the supportive barrier must start. Its height must reach 28 meters above the water level. Early November 1964, the race against time reaches a critical stage. After the heavy rains in Ethiopia, the level of the Nile rises to only two meters below the barrier. Everywhere, everybody works ceaselessly. All the work on the blocks can start or the facade has to be covered with a thick layer of sand to protect it from the falling stones. In the most sensitive places, the sand is applied by hand. Trained excavators level the plateau of the temple. A protective shelf is erected to prevent the huge blocks from collapsing on the sand and the facade. Broken rocks are used in the construction of the barrier. The end of February 1965, the barrier is finally completed. The facade is completely buried under the sand, just like before its discovery. To reach the interior of the temple, the only way is through a narrow corridor made of steel. Inside the temple, 240 tons of steel beams provide support. These are covered with plastic material or foam so as not to damage the mural paintings or the ceilings. segment is numbered for the future reassembling of the monuments. The real difficulties start when they turn their attention to the rock dominating the temples. The rapid movement of the metal wires separate the enormous blocks. Then, the electric saws take over. But this is still only a general rehearsal. 
It isn't necessary to be precise here. Large incisions are acceptable. The blocks are separated one by one. The drills are only used outside the temple. The work is extremely slow as the vibrations produced by the hammers and saws have to be monitored constantly. The volume of rock dominating the temple is decreasing. Some blocks are now ready to be transported. But now comes a very delicate stage. Some of the rock has to be cut so finely it must be done by hand. It's so fragile it would disintegrate at the slightest contact with water. Every block has to be numbered exactly to be put back in the same place when reconstructing the temples. 1,047 blocks for the monuments, 7,700 blocks of rock surrounding them, each block weighing anything between 20 and 30 tons. In order to transport these huge masses safely, anchorage bars are fixed to them by means of synthetic gum. The biggest blocks are those of the heads of the statues. The engineers wanted to limit the amount of sawing performed on them. They start by covering the surfaces with a plastic layer. first incision of the saw, they must continue the work without pausing day and night. At the slightest pause, the rock could disintegrate. last, the moment the reporters and photographers have been waiting for all night. Ramsey's face is amputated. One last look at the now naked facade, he is transported to the storage area on the platforms, specially constructed for this purpose. The storage area lies near the chosen new site. position and number of each block is written out as would happen with a book in the library. During his short stay there the Pharaoh King can observe the round roofs of the huts of the thousands of workers. He 
can even catch a glimpse of the swimming pool, a real mirage in the desert. The level of the Nile now rises above the original level of the temples, but the monument has been saved just in time. And so the days go by. The cutting and transporting of the blocks becomes routine. There are no hitches. Every block is carefully connected to the platform. Meanwhile, the work inside the temple goes on. Every day, new wonders are brought to light. Can we detect a look of awe and maybe of fear in the eyes of the majestic pharaoh as he sees our modern technology that prevents him from falling to dust? The saw cuts up the pillars with very careful, precise movements. Exposed to the elements, these surfaces are extremely fragile. From now on, even if the waters were to cover the barrier before the expected time, they wouldn't drown more than the pharaoh's feet and ankles. The last bus relief is ready to be transported and, by a strange coincidence, it bears the same motto as that of the rescue operation, the unity of the Upper and Lower Nile, the symbol of fertility. Already on the plateau, the workers are getting ready for the reconstruction of the temple. Before that, however, the ground has been levelled and the angle of reconstruction calculated exactly so as to achieve twice in the year that same prodigious light effect. And the reconstruction of the interior of the temple begins. The steel girders which were used to safeguard the dismantling of the temple are used again. Thanks to the precision with which the blocks were cut, the process of reconstruction is easily carried out. The original site is now abandoned and submerged by the Nile. Meanwhile, on the new site, the monuments are brought back to life as each block is fitted into place.
and the last phase of the operation, the reassembling of the 20 meter high colossi. The Pharaoh's face is fixed back on. There's a moment of suspense. The operation is a success. The statues look just the same as before the operation. Technical expertise in transporting and reconstructing the temples is not everything. The rocky scenery surrounding the temples has to be recreated. It will have to be landscaped over an area of 12,000 square meters, but first a barrier of concrete has to be erected to protect the temples. Above the temple the dome is 60 meters high. It's made of segments of concrete measuring 1.8 meters at the summit and 2.3 meters at the base. This gigantic construction uses up 10,000 square meters of concrete. The top of the dome is 10 meters thick. It is required to bear the